Hey everybody, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour, and I've been reading the book of Exodus a whole bunch lately, and here's my best attempt to quickly summarize what I'm seeing there. Exodus is a tricky read because you and I are used to the idea of the hero's journey, where you got the young guy who goes out to conquer the world, but as he does so, he realizes he has some problems of his own that he has to overcome through learning and training from a mentor. Then once his problems are overcome, he's ready to go and defeat the great evil out there and solve all the problems. This is not Exodus. The main character of Exodus doesn't have any problems to overcome doesn't have any flaws that he needs to go through because the main character is God. And so what happens structurally in Exodus that's weird is that the big external enemy gets defeated in the first half of the book. And in, then in the second half of the book, we discover the real problems and flaws in the sympathetic character in the book of Exodus, that being the Hebrew people. Here's what I mean. At the beginning of the book of Exodus, you've got God's chosen people, the people through whom redemption is somehow going to come in slavery under the thumb of the greatest superpower the world had ever known at this point. It doesn't seem like a good recipe for these people being a blessing to all the nations and redemption coming through these people that it looks like they're going to be a footnote to history that's just gradually snuffed out and absorbed into some larger story of some other people group. It's a big, big problem. Further, God's chosen people are being violently oppressed. They're forced to do backbreaking labor. The first supervillain of the Bible that we're ever introduced to, Pharaoh, is throwing their babies into the river. It's a horrible situation. Well, out of this, one little boy gets delivered by being thrown into a river, just this time in a basket. He gets floated down the river. This is Moses. He gets picked up and raised and adopted by an Egyptian lady. And the result is that Moses lives this dual life. He's got a foot in two different worlds, and he becomes empathetic to the plight of his people. He goes on a little bit of a hero's journey, if you will, out into the desert where he has a, a confrontation with God. And out there at the famous burning bush, God reveals himself, even revealing his name that I am God, I am essence, I am being. And this God sends Moses on a quest, a journey, like you're going to be my instrument to liberate these people and move my redemptive story for all of history forward. So Moses goes back. This isn't exactly in his wheelhouse. He gets help from Aaron and, well, major help from God, who does miraculous things from the beginning to make it clear that he's behind this. Now, early on, Pharaoh, this vile supervillain, isn't responsive to much of any of it. The text describes him as hardening his own heart. No supernatural influence. He's just a murderous, power-hungry jerk. And Moses says, hey, like this, these things are going to happen. There's going to be a series of plagues. And so the series of plagues divided into two halves of five plagues each demonstrate God's authority over all of the lesser Egyptian gods and their lesser power. Eventually, this culminates in the Passover, where the text of Exodus even takes a little bit of a detour to lay out how this Hebrew festival of Passover, this commemoration of this event wherein the blood of the lamb was placed on their doorposts to serve as a protection from the judgment of God, the angel of death who killed all the firstborns who weren't under this protection of uh, symbolized by the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And so the Egyptians lose their firstborns, and that finally breaks Pharaoh, even though Pharaoh's an interesting character because at this point, the language in Exodus starts to shift toward God hardening his heart. Well, Pharaoh says, fine, go, but then pretty quickly changes his minds after the Israelites pack up and start heading out to, well, where do they even go? The wilderness. So Pharaoh rallies his army, chases them down somewhere out along a body of water, and then God miraculously delivers the Hebrew people through the waters, maybe points even toward a New Testament picture of baptism, but then the waters close in on Pharaoh's army when he chases them in. The Hebrew people on the other side of the sea sing a song of celebration that demonstrates that they're starting to get a sense of the character of this God and that they're starting to sense that indeed there's an ongoing relationship that's going to happen here for generations to come. Well, then the story takes an interesting shift after the Israelites, the Hebrews, fend off an attack from the Amalekites. They wander around in the desert. God provides for them supernaturally. But we start to get more clarity as to what kind of people the Hebrews are and what kind of God God is. 
God, it turns out, is super powerful, super faithful, super merciful, but also he will punish evil. And so we've got this whole scene that dominates the second half of the book of Exodus where we get to know more about the main character as Moses interacts with God. And God initiates a deal, a covenant with the people of Israel over several chapters that starts with 10 basic commandments, instructions, and then that expands into a multitude of other instructions, all of it painting a picture for what a society could look like that is better and more moral than what we just got done with in the evil of Egypt. But while God is explaining all of that stuff in a miraculous cloud on top of this mountain, the people down below, knowing God is up there, they just get impatient. And the Hebrews are like, ah, we want a God we can see who isn't way up there on that mountain. And so they convince Aaron, who helped Moses with the whole Exodus thing, to craft this golden calf using gold that God miraculously provided them during their escape from Egypt. Well, Moses comes down. He's not impressed. God's not impressed. Moses contends with God to say, don't destroy this people, even though your judgments would be correct. Let's instead, let's, let's tell this other story about who you are and your character. And it looks, at least from a human perspective, like God relents, though the larger text of the Bible makes it clear that God knew what was going on all along. And then God lays out some more details about what it looks like for them to dwell together, for God to live in their presence, for them to build like a portable home for God that gets called the tabernacle and to build an Ark of the Covenant that holds certain artifacts that communicate the deal and remind future generations of the deal between God and his people and that is the place of God's most holy presence as he operates among them. So the tension that we leave off with here at the end of the book of Exodus is then we conquered this great evil without right at the beginning through the power of God. The supervillain Pharaoh and his evil empire are defeated. Now we can see a pathway by which God's chosen people could be the vehicle through whom God's redemptive plan plays out. But they're pretty screwed up. And even with God's presence right there in front of them, they'll chase after other gods. They have problems like you and I have problems. What then does it look like for a perfect, righteous, good God who has a plan that will not be thwarted? What does it look like for such a God to live in community and to be in relationship with a flawed people like us or like the Hebrews? And that tension gets worked out throughout the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament.